Okay, in this presentation, we're gonna look at these self-adhesive stamps. We all know them as peel and stick. Pretty straightforward. It's a fascinating presentation to put together. I really enjoyed working on it. And so we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and we all know about the ugly part. We'll look at the history. We'll actually look at how they're produced, the printing process, the different formats that are available, what you have for collecting, and what are your options? How can you store these things? Some interesting varieties with some Canadian examples and what's the future for these stamps. And I thought that was a pretty impressive $26.95 peel and stick stamp, wow. Okay, the good, obviously they're sanitary. People like them, they're easy to use. And back in 1969, when Tonga, the, uh, the island in the Pacific brought them to the market, they said, look, in humid climates, it's, it's easy to store them. The bad, of course, one would expect them to be more expensive to print, um, but not for you. The mints are more difficult to mount into albums. And the ugly part, of course, if the stamps are produced without the release agent, soaking them off paper is very challenging. And you can get these residues that can stick to, uh, can make stamps stick to each other. So those are the ugly part of it. So the first off issue was in 64, a set of seven commemorating New York's World's Fair. And then uh, they also had seven airmail. Those ones you don't read about as, as frequently as, uh, as the first set of seven. They had a map of the country. The second was Tonga. I didn't know anything about Tonga. Um, it's actually a, has the population of the city of Albany, about 100,000. It's in the Pacific. And it spans a set and a part of the ocean of the Pacific that's as big as Texas. Uh, apparently, uh, they aspire to be a banana republic. 270,000 uh, miles. And they put their first set he's for the 69 with a banana. And I thought this person who was writing this letter was pretty clever. They wanted to add a little bit of an artistic flair. So they put it as a, a, these four shilling stamps as a bunch of bananas. I thought that was clever. <laughs> the United States, their first was in 1974. It's a 10 cent Christmas. And within months, oh, yes. the adhesive came up and soaked up through the, the paper and caused this discoloration. And a color collectors, of course, complained. He couldn't soak it off. Limb Stamp News reports that, in quote, this, this fiasco of a stamp issue delayed the next self-adhesive for many years. I'm assuming that the original stamp color was white, but I have never seen an original one. I don't know if, there, if there's any premium on them if they are white. Um, it would be an interesting to see if anybody still has any that would, did not, that survived the, the, the adhesive soaking through. Um, and they were pre-canceled. So presumably because everyone knew that, well, it couldn't be soaked off and reused. Second issue was this 25 cent Eagle and Shield from 89, 15 years later. Paints the strips of 18, so that would have made a face value of $4.50. They sold it for five. There was that 50 cent premium. It was not popular. And it was only experimental in 15 states. Interestingly, this is what caught me really by surprise, is that that shield and booklet with 18 cent stamps now is available on eBay for less than face value at $3.37. So if you need postage, well, maybe you can buy some bunch of these. That's mm -hmm. a booklet of this face value of $4.50 and peel and stick stamps. I'm, I'm sure you can still use them. So they're available on the internet. Why did they wait 15 years to issue a second one? I don't know. Interestingly, because in 1989 is also the year that Canada started producing them. So obviously they've been working together, solving the glue problem. Maybe there was enough collectors that realized that collectors within the US Postal Service that realized that if we go self-adhesive, it does make collecting very difficult. And I can't speak for the USPS. Uh, since 2002, almost all stamps were self-adhesive. Now, I've added this sentence, but there's a lot more details will come up in the presentation that the, from the United States Postal Service, actual presentation that talks about what stamps are, are available in uh, WAG, is the water activated gum. They, all, uh, they call it WAG, or water activated gum. 2006, 
the USPS changed their rules. Up to that time, if you produced peel and stick stamps, they had to be soakable. 2006, they changed it and said, look, if you're making stamps for us, don't worry about it if they can't be soaked off. Of course, that made collecting used stamps extremely difficult. So up to 2006, the peel and stick stamps should be soakable. In 2016, they produced some soakable stamps with water activated gum uh, on this uh, Classics Forever souvenir sheet. And that also featured engraved printing. So trying to get back to the do its roots in, in this, at least in this one. Um, Canada, our first issue was in 83, although the Lynn Stamp News doesn't credit this as being a stamp. Uh, this is actually a, a stick and tick. It was a label that you applied to an envelope and then you addressed it. And then in this little box down here on the bottom, you ticked off the postal code L7, well, this is S4, P, uh, 2C2. So this is, so you would help. The idea was to help Canada Post and speed Christmas mail processing by having this code already on the envelope and hoping that the machines could pick that up, that people would follow the instructions. It, I'm not sure how well it worked because in the next year, they tried to improve on that. They realized that people weren't putting these things in the right places on the envelope. So they separated the stamp, which is now a, a separate peel and stick stamp, and the tick label was separate. The, the instruction said, put the stamp right in the top right-hand corner, put the tick label in exactly in the bottom right-hand corner. This guy didn't follow those instructions. He shifted it away. And I can imagine that people really didn't follow the instructions and it made it hard for the, the actual sorting machines to be able to figure out where the ticks were. Um, but interesting, Lee Valley Tools, this is the letter to whom this is addressed, is an important part of my collection. It makes it something I bought there. One of their tools for my stamp hobby is, is I use it every day I use my stamps basically. So we'll talk about that one another time. And then of course their first stamp was the same year as the US came out. With a, we had a 38 cent flag and a 39 cent, follow, 39 cent flag followed the year later. This is the more conventional booklet configuration, all with straight, straight die cuts. The four layer stamp construction. Oh, now we're gonna look at how you actually produce these. And we have, of course, it's a four layers. We have the stamp paper with the image. We have the release agent, which is the polyvinyl alcohol. Uh, it's not PVA glue. PVA glue is the standard for, for the actual stamps, but this is another release agent that dissolves in water. We have the pressure sensitive adhesive, PSA acronym. It's an aqueous emulsion. And we have the silicone coated backing paper. Those are the four layers that are used when you're producing these self-adhesive stamps. They, there may or may not be graphics on the back of the, uh, the silicone paper. So how do, you, what, how do you do this? Well, of course you print the image on the paper and then you reapply this release agent to the stamp paper. Now, these two could be in reverse order, the reverse, reverse the release agent could already be on there before the stamp is printed. The third step is you take the adhesive and you apply it to the backing paper. Keep in mind, it's an aqueous solution, it's in water. Then you take this backing paper with the adhesive, feed it through an oven, the water evaporates and it leaves the sticky adhesive behind on the backing paper. Then you take this stamp paper with the release agent and you feed it in a pair of rollers with the back in, in a laminating process onto the backing paper with the adhesive. So that gives you the four layer construction. Somewhere along the way, tagging is applied. I don't know if it's after the stamp has already been applied to the, uh, the backing paper or if it's actually part of the printing image, I don't know. It could be either way, but there is tagging applied somewhere along the process. I stuck it in here. And then of course the stamp is die cut to produce the, pri the final product. Um, the tagging is done before it's die cut. So if you have other errors, they will show up as tagging errors in the die cutting process. Are, are you clear, Arnie, on why any country would go through all this trouble to, to manufacture these difficult stamps rather than to simply do what they did before? Why did they do this? Uh, I think they realize that the public, public is, prefers them. They're easier to use. 
people don't like licking something that somebody else has touched. So there's a yes, sanitary but, but, side, probably become more evident with COVID, of course. But, but I think there's a sanitary side, there's the ease of use. Um, one would expect it to be more expensive yeah. to do this. In the US, and we'll see in the, in the slides that follow on, that the paper used to produce water-activated gum stamps is not available in the US. Huh. It has to be imported. And the details on the costs are coming up later on and the more, more explanation about the cost issues um, in, a, in a later slide. But in Canada, it, it would only one would expect all this has to cost more. It's also heavier. It's heavier, it's, it's, it's shipping weight is gonna be higher. There's gonna be lots of co extra costs along the way than shipping stamps. There were other countries between 74 and 89, there were other countries that had been playing with it, generally uh, smaller countries. Um, and of course, the obvious is, is the humidity. The humidity, in, if you're at a postal agency in, in a humid Caribbean country or Poly Polynesian country, of course, humidity is an issue. And the water activated gum ones are, are in the sense, you know, obviously have a, a, a disadvantage there. So there is a bit of an issue there. I'm trying to figure out what, what the release agent is about because you would think that the gum would have to be on the back of the stamp itself. And then there's this release agent in between. No, the, the release agent is water soluble. So that allow, when you take a used stamp and put it in water, the PVA gum, the release agent allows the stamp paper to be uh, removed from the, now the, from, the, from the adhesive. Now the newer, of course, the newer US stamps don't have this release agent anymore. Okay, all right, that makes sense now. Good. Now, I think part of the, man, part of the reason why do you produce them? I think one of the reasons is, is that the postal service realizes that they're not very efficient at canceling. And there are a lot of people who, who can soak used stamps off paper and reuse them and defraud the, the postal administrations of, yeah. of money. So I think there's a, although they don't say this. So the die cutting is the next part of it. The last step, you can either have straight die cuts like the two examples on the left uh, from Canada, or you can do what's called serpentine. So you'll read, you'll read about serpentine. It's, the idea is that it looks like a snake. It's actually a die cut. And it's interesting because when you're die cutting them, the die cut machine actually comes down and doesn't cut through the paper, but not through the backing paper, okay? The other option is in more modern in some of the newer ones where you actually die cut them to a particular stamp, the shape of the stamp. Here are some Canadian examples, one for the Blue Jays in a very funny shape. And another one that celebrated different kinds of, of pastry desserts, and including, including the Nanaimo bars, one of my favorites. Those are your three choices, basically. Uh, the die cutting, as I said, can be either on all four sides or two sides. Now, I looked at this stamp, and it, it sparked the question that I'm throwing out to you collectors. What are these bars that we see uh, above the value on all of these die cut stamps? Are they tagging bars? Has anybody ever looked at these under the under UV light or what are they? They look so bizarre to see them, but they're always above the value, which would suggest that some machine can then identify where the bar is and look for the white text. Or the color or the color of the bar tells it. I mean, uh, they can cancel regular stamps on a letter on the assumption that they've, they've got the tagging. So they know there's a stamp there. But on these, it has to know which stamp is there, whether it's the correct amount. So I suspect it might be just the color of the bars. Now, the formats that we can have these self-adhesive stamps, obviously, we knock about coils. They're on a thin backing paper, usually about 40 pounds per ream. Uh, a ream is about 500 sheets. Printing on the backing of, of, of on a, on the, for the coils is less common compared to booklets. We'll talk about booklet formats later. Most of the coils are serpentine, virtually all of them are. I think, I don't think I've seen a, a, a coil that isn't serpentine die cut. And you can, here's two versions. You can either have what I call salvage. Uh, this is my own word for it. I don't know what, how would you would distinguish between the two types here. One case where the, you can see the backing paper 
Um, between the stamps, you can see the backing paper at the top. Um, so that's the, that's really the options that you have in terms of how you collect these coils, is with or without. You know, you know, that's how they're printed. Not you have it's not a collecting option. It's just how they're done. The formats with or without salvage. Maybe there's a proper name for it. Interesting. They don't have that bar on definitives. No, it's only on, on the high value. values I've seen. The only place I've seen that is the bars on, on the high value. When you're collecting them for the coils, you have a choice of you can collect them individually as singles, and that means sort of hoping that that you can tear the the backing paper between the stamps and not get you know get a reasonable set. You can collect them as pairs, obviously, or in strips of four or five. Seems to be that. Interestingly, in, in Canada, the, all of the catalog that what, what collectors do is strips of four. And what I've seen in the, in the what's for sale in the, in eBay is mainly strips of five for US to, uh, coils. Or of course you can buy a complete coil of a hundred or a thousand or 3000 or 10,000. Some of those coils are pretty big. We'll see some, some 10,000 stamp coils later. Interesting, this was, a, this was fascinating, I thought. And maybe someone else can shed some insight into what this is. The pattern doesn't may not repeat in a typical sequence. So, and this is this issue of orchids. There's ten stamps, ten different stamps, and if I number them arbitrarily, one to ten for the first ten in the strip, and then the next group it misses one, two, three, and it just goes four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then the last ten are the the first ten repeated. Oh. So, in this strip of twenty-seven to twenty, this is this is what Linz is suggesting that you collect for this issue. Believe it or not, they want you to collect a coil strip of 17. And this is their, this is the instructions. This is this is taken from the, the eBay sellers. He's posted this. This you can read it in white there. And I repeated it so you can read it easier in the presentation that a collector can remove from a roll a plate number strip of 17 and immediately following the strip of 10, a strip of 10 without the plate number. This neatly covers all 27 stamps in the plate number interval. Therefore, in each strip of 27 stamps, the three stamps found at the beginning appear one less time. So does that That's mean the printing plate actually had only 27 stamps in it and you'd have multiple, you'd have multiple plates uh, on the drum? This, if anyone can shed any insight into this, I have to admit, Scott's, Scott's is a little more realistic. They recommend a strip of 10. Uh, I, I can't even remember how you didn't collect a strip of 17 in an album of any kind. Yeah, right. The 10 you could probably do vertically. Uh, 17? Oh, sorry, that's, that's a typo. So Jeff, that's a typo. That Linz says coil strip of 27, not 17. You can see it in the, in the text here. I'm, I mistyped it there. They say collector 17 and 10 more. Another example of a pattern not repeating. Here I've numbered them one, two, three, four, and then we suddenly see one, three, four. We missed stamp number two in the pattern, and we're going back to number one and two. Huh. Next thing you can collect within these coils is look at those plate numbers, the PNCs. Some, and I'm confused. These three issues all have a plate number B1111. This eBay seller on the right actually shows a scan of the five stamps. They have a strip of five here. And he identifies it as a plate number on the front. And then there's this other number on the back. So I don't know if the B1111 is actually a plate number or it's just designating that the stamp on the back has the actual plate number. But I can't tell this. I have, so if anyone has some of these coil strips, it'd be curious to look at if the, the, the B111 to me looks more like just your traffic lights to verify that all the colors, you had your cyan, yellow, black, red, and black have been used, that's all. I did a search for B111 on eBay and found 120 results. And not just coils, but also plate blocks, another plate block B111. This is how they're described. These are eBay descriptions. And here's another one. PNC5 seems to be plate number five. Five seems to be the number of stamps in. And this one just got, they collect one and one and the four or three in between. When I did this, this, spark what was coming up on the next slides. I read about this mystery message from a 2021 issue. And I was curious, mystery message, what do you mean? A stamp with a mysterious message in it? We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. When you're collecting Canadian coils, uh, you can also collect the rolls, of course, this is a single roll. 
But here's the key thing. If you want to collect Canadian stamps, they offer these quarterly packs. And the quarterly packs look like this. And yes, they're issued four times a year. And they have every stamp that was produced by Canada Post, even all the die cut stamps, even if they're in booklets, even if they're in coils, they issue them separately as an individual stamp that can be mounted in an album. The actual die cut, they, they're, the actual printing is done on a thicker backing paper, like a booklet backing paper, and the die cut goes right through. So these, these stamps are die cut, many of these stamps here, uh, these two here are die cuts. So you don't have to buy a booklet, you don't have to buy the souvenir sheet, they come already die cut and they specifically target collectors. So for about $100 a year, you can collect all mint stamps that Canada produces in a given calendar year. But these are now, in effect, separate stamps. You really want to collect both. If you want this and the quote, but then the struggle of yeah, collecting. The, re how the you regular collect. ones, the ones that are not part of this pack. Yeah. They're different. They're not. If you want not. to collect postal issue ones, um, then you need to collect the coils and, and yeah, booklets yeah. And, and everything else like that. But at least this gives you collectors an option for an, a single, to get every issue. Has Unitrade picked up the difference and listed them as separate items? The yes, the, what's called the die cut. Yes, they 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 will list this stamp as a separate stamp under this same uh, catalog number, and they'll is specifically it, say in the description die cut from quarterly pack. Is it is it higher price because they're obviously less yes. common? Because yeah. yes, you have to. The only way you can get them is out of here to get the backing paper off. It's very difficult. And sometimes the perforations are different. They are on a backing paper that is thicker. You don't have to worry about any glue or anything else. You can store them easily. They are at face value and you don't have to buy booklets of 10 or 20. You can get them online from the, the Canada Post website. You can also collect them as pairs, but then you have this, this problem of the, you know, the extra stamps. And you can collect them as rolls. Strips of four is what Canada generally collects. Canadians generally collect strips of four. Or you can collect the full rolls. Now, where in the U.S. you have these plate numbers for collecting coils, in Canada we have what are called gutter strips, which have the printing information every, usually 10 stamps. This is repeated. And uh, it includes the, the traffic lights, uh, cyan, red, and yellow and a black and another red of pink or kind and then a gray, they needed gray obviously for the, the Canada. So they didn't use a, a partial black. Now, interestingly in Canada, we've had uh, these gutter strips. Sometimes there's a spelling mistake in them. There's one of one, at least one that's got a variety where the spelling mistake is different. You have to, there's some of the errors or varieties in terms of what's the printing on the, on the gutter strip. We also have roll starter strips for collectors. And they have a different serration across the bottom at the first roll in a roll of 100. So there's only one of these in every roll of 100. And there's an ending roll strip too, where again, it has a different serration. And there's even in some rolls, the variety, the specialists, this serration is different. So you have two different types of rolls, starter roll strips based on the difference in the, in the, in the, uh, not only do you have differences in spelling and typos and mistakes, but you also have differences in the type of serration between at the start and the end of a roll. Some of the varieties, we had some interesting varieties when we first produced these coils. The dyes that were used, we had what are called compound perfs on the left here, where the perforation on the top and the perforation on the bottom differed by at least one. In many, in many cases, they differed by a quarter or a half or three quarters, but for variety purposes and to distinguish what a variety is, it has to differ by at least one. And so if you had more different perforations, so like a seven, seven and a half on the, on, the, on the bottom and a nine on the top, that would qualify as a compound perf. Um, tagging varieties, of course, an early printing and a late printing had a different kind of tagging. We had one issue on this, one of these issues here, had we called what was called a ski, ski jump, a misperf. Happened once in a roll of 100, I think. The, the, the way that the die worked, there was this one ski jump in it and, and it's constant. 
Hundreds so there of thousands were, of these are available. The actual die cutter then had at least a hundred places, and one of them was just manufactured yes. with wrong. And that that whole area of of die cutting, because as I said, there's a seven and a half by seven and a quarter on the top, and a seven and a quarter by seven and three quarters on the top. All that has that's a massive project which has been undertaken by Robin Harris out of uh, out of Saskatchewan. Saskatoon. He's figured out each of these plates and plated each to each stamp could be figured out where it came from in, a, in this plate of 100. So the other format we have is the booklets. They're on a thicker backing paper, 80 pounds. We often see printing on the back and they can be either serpentine or straight cut. Here's an example of a pane of Canadian Definitives and the US uh, pane, it's just a solid cardstock. On the back of the US, it's just your barcode number. Canadians do, they don't offer any flat panes. If they're doing a booklet, it's always a folded booklet. And so with a cover, and then there'll be more information on the back, including the barcode on the back. If you really want to collect, oh, collecting booklets. Well, in the United States, they, they're available as panes that can be folded into booklet with instructions on how to do it. You have to remove actually a center strip from here. And if you're starting to collect these, we'd suggest that you not remove them and not collect them as folded, although they might fit nicer in your book and it may look nicer. But I think if you're interested in, in collection value, you want to keep them as unfolded booklets. But that assumes, well, there's a huge assumption that the values of these will go up with time. Canadian books, all, all booklets are pre-folded. Uh, so you yeah, really have no choice. If you are mounting in the albums and front contains interesting graphics, you might want to consider collecting two booklets in order that you can see the front and see the stamps. Or you could, did I, does, does SAFE make uh, pages for this or, 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 or Linder T so that you can look at both sides without uh, having to collect two? I suspect they I do. I don't know of any collection. Linder T, Linder T system has blank pages. So yeah, you could certainly get uh, a page. Yeah, you could use, yeah, you can use blank pages. Yeah. I haven't seen much interesting graphics on the back of the American ones. But I haven't seen too many of them. So you have to, people can probably provide more insight into that. Now, as I said earlier on, when I saw this, this uh, plate B1111, I saw this mystery message pane from 2021. And this, in, there are two things about this. Can anybody see the mystery message in it? Well, there are letters there, but I can't, I don't, don't know how they work. Well, we'll look at it at the end. We can have a big, at the very end, my last slide has this in a bigger version, but there is a message there. With, with letters, when I searched for them, that they are imperf panes. I didn't realize that the US, in addition to issuing perforated panes, also issued imperf panes. And that, and for $21.99, that's a fabulous price in my books for an imperf pane. I didn't realize it at the time. This is pretty ordinary stuff because you've got, a, you can buy a lot of imperf booklets or panes, whatever you want to call them. The die cutting omitted. Now for Canada, you can also collect imperf booklets. These are six from my personal collection. Yes, I bought them all at, or they were all bought at Burlington post offices, but they are errors. They are, and they're listed in catalogs, Unitrade for, and Scott presumably too. They list them as imperf pairs. They put a catalog value on an imperf pair from this booklet. Catalog value for these six booklets based on pairs, not the fact that they are actually as booklets, just as pairs is over $15,000. These pairs here are $800 each, the nativity. These are 400 and these are 500. Just Barney, let pairs. me know when you go to the post office again. I wanna hang out with you. <laughs> I got lucky. I got lucky, that's for sure. And the postal clerk knows me and in the case of this one, she had, it had come in, she had seen that it was an imperf booklet. She knows I collect that stuff and she put it in a separate folder for me. And next time I went in, she said, here's, here's, this is for you. I paid her face value for them. I got a receipt, M-O-R-E-T-H-A-N-M-E-E-T-S-T-H-E-E-Y-E -E 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 and an exclamation mark. That's the mystery message. So a few, three slides just on some varieties. This is an imperf. Uh, number 1707 from a booklet pane. I think what happened here is 
that whenever somebody realized it was imperfect, they looked up this person's name, got the phone number, wrote it on the envelope and phoned, said, do you have any more? This is an imperfect strip of three that I gave to a lady friend of mine. She mailed it to her sister, or Shrestha, a nun. And uh, so then I got it back from her, but that's an imperf strip of three. The, we talked about these before, forgeries. Here's two examples of, of forgeries on self-adhesive uh, stamps from different issues. One is the 2304 from 2009, this is the 2252 from 2007. Somebody went to a lot of effort to produce these forgeries and the postal marking says this item is being returned. It's being identified as counterfeit postage, please call customer service. I don't know how the one ever got returned to anybody, unless there was a label that they removed. And it was it was yeah. sent to the municipal court in Montreal. That's how, how bizarre. Another now I'm looking at another kind of postal marking variety. The this picture on the left shows the envelope that was mailed from FEH stamps, a dealer in Vancouver. He mailed me some stuff. It was returned to him with this label on it. Because in 2020, the Postal Service was canceled since there were no direct flights from Canada to Qatar. Put the R on Qatar, I forgot that too. <laughs> and so it was returned to him. And then when the service was resumed, he could peel off the top label and underneath it was the second label already there. And he could put it rack in the mail. Now, of course, when I heard about this, of course, my daughters, I summoned my daughter, asked my daughters to quickly send me a bunch of mail. And of course, I have quite a few of these return to sender labels and then resume service labels afterwards. But that was the idea that they knew this was temporary and that once the service was, was restored, they could, uh, you could peel off the top label and then send the label and it was already, you wouldn't have to re put new postage on it. So that's an interesting, postal marking variety on a self-adhesive stamp. Another postal marking variety on a letter, my son sent a birthday card to his mother my, and my ex-wife in Burlington. He was a student at, in university. The envelope was translucent. You can almost see it was sort of waxy. And, he, and the clerk on the back, he had written 50 numerous times. It was for my wife's 50th birthday. The card was oversized and needed additional postage. And the postal clerk realized that this was likely some a student sending a card to his mother and he took compassion and said, the postal marking is forwarded as a courtesy in both French and English. You could see the card through it. He saw the fifties on the back. He saw the name Jansen up the top corner. He saw Peggy Jansen down here. So he put it all together and whoever the clerk was, I have to say thank you to the clerk, not only for getting Peggy her birthday card on time, but also for adding one to my collection. So those are three little varieties on, on self-adhesive stamps. This is, this is an interesting find. It's a horizontal die cut strip of three without the pressure sensitive release agent, agent sorry, but with the PVA water soluble release agent, it's number 1878. I have the VGA certificate because I've submitted it to them and that's what they say. And, and what it, the reason I've included it here is because it helps understand how they're printed. This issue was originally printed on the, by Ashton Potters with web offset lithography. And they had a 20 inch wide roll of paper. They call it a web. We don't know where the printing was actually done, but the, it was the Ashton Potters Buffalo facility that applied the adhesive and did the die cutting. During production, the pressure sensitive adhesive was not properly applied, leaving okay. small areas without adhesive. And after they laminated it, everything looked wide on this 20 inch web. But when they cut it into five smaller strips, groups of these three stamps fell off. The support action postures then contacted the glue suppliers that help. And that glue supplier was my friend. <laughs> so he got me these. And yeah, there's three of them. He got three of them. One he kept, one I kept, and one I sold for him for $1,000. The future. Well, where are we going with stamps? In the U.S., it's exclusively self-adhesive, typically in booklets and panes of 20 for the commems. Uh, that's... That's a lot to collect. That's an expensive collection. The Canadians, uh, we have mostly self-adhesive. We have some water activated gum. The souvenir sheet here, Calla Lily souvenir sheet, as you can see is perforated with water activated gum. We have some souvenir sheets, some larger paints. There's a Queen Elizabeth paint that's self-adhesive. And for all the definitives, the, both the low and the high value, here's the whale, the $10 whale. And it's an engraved 
with with uh, water activated gum. That's the future. And here's your mystery stamp.